Okay, thank you for uh, Sura for, for reminding me of recording this uh, this uh, lecture. Right. So so from the previous lecture, we know that um, B U V is B linear form, and if you fix U, there will be a unique I such that B U V is equal to I U. Right. So you we also show that A is linear. A is bounded. A is bijective from H to S in the sense that for all of U in H, there is a v, unique B in H such that A. Uh, uh, a V is equal to U, and this is important. This is extremely important. Um, now, there's uh, another thing, which is the operator L on the right hand side, right? So L is uh, an a linear operator from H to O R, right? So this is linear and continuous. So L is in the dual of H star, of H, right? So um, because this is a linear and continuous mapping from H to R, this should be uh, uh, um, uh, this should be uh, uh, in in the dual space H star, right? Now, now, uh, now, so so because L is in H star, remind I remind you that we are considering a special case H is L two, but but. Uh, this proof should be applied to any Hilbert space you can think of, right? So now, because L is in H star, um, what can I um, what can I say about L, L uh, V for all of the V in H? Right. So my question is because L is in the dual dual space of H, what can you say about the form of L? Right. So L is L is a bounded and linear continuous operator from H to R. S is L two. Right. So this is a linear operator in L two, which means that L is in the dual of L two. Uh, Right. So, what is the form of L? We have a very special form for this operator. Very special form for this operator. Can you tell me what what is the form of L? I mean, because even if you pick any linear operator on L two, what is the form of this linear operator? No? This is something that we just use here. What is it? Right. So, so how can I say that there is a unique IU such that BUV is equal to AUV? What theorem did I use? So I say that okay, B is if I fix U, then B is become a linear and continuous operator on H because the variable now is only B, right? And then I say that there's a unique A U such that B U V is equal to A U V. So what theorem did I use? For the existence of A U. So we use the risk representation theorem, right? So here is exactly, exactly the same situation, right? So you have a linear operator on, on S star. You apply the risk representation theorem. This means that there is a unique W in H such that LV is equal to uh, 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 the, uh, the, the inner product of WV. Can you hear me? It's clear. Can you hear me? No? Uh, yes. Okay. Good. Um, right. So, so we know that, okay, because V is in H, uh, L is in H, right? So, which means that LV has to have a special form, which is the inner product of V uh, and W, which is, um, 
which is the uh, the, in, the product of wx and vx and you integrate the, uh, this product all right so so this is risk theorem again right so this w is unique and this is char characterized uh, by this operator l right so l is a linear operator from um a continuous operator from h to r which mean that which mean that by using the risk theorem i can um i can write lv as the inner product of w and b w is some vector in h this is risk theorem right so this is exactly like what we use here right so now now uh so now can you make the connection okay so let, let me turn to the other place right so i remind you that okay this b uv will be the inner product of au and b all right au is linear and bounded and injective and 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 and, and, and and it is very powerful in the sense that um, um, for all of that u in h, there is a unique v in h. Maybe I, I gotta turn this into something w. There is a unique w prime in h such that a w prime is equal to w, right? This is one thing. Now, uh, now there is something even uh, stronger. So you're gonna have what? You're gonna have LV. There is a unique W such that LV will be equal to WV, right? So this is risk theorem again. We keep using the risk theorem. Um. Um. Right. So 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 there is a W such that. L of V is equal to the inner product of W and V. This is risk theorem. Um, so, because there is, so, so we know that for all of W and H, there is a unique W prime in H, such that A W prime is equal to W, right? So, so, so I'm gonna pick this W. I'm gonna pick this W and with this W, with the W, of star, there is a unique W prime in H such that A W prime is equal to W, right? So, so we know that, okay, if I fix B, if I fix U, there is a unique AU such that B, V, U, V is equal to A, U, V for all of the V. And then we even know that even for all of the W in H, there is a unique W prime in H such that A W prime is equal to W. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna consider this W right in in this place right. So this W is the vector in H such that L V is equal to W V by risk theorem. Now I pick this W and then there is a unique W prime in H such that A W prime is equal to W right. So this W and this W, they're the same, right? And this is also this W, right? So now I'm gonna write LUV, WV. And this is going to give me a W prime V, and this is B, W prime V, right? It's clear? So you know that LV will be the inner product of W and V. But this is also a W prime V because because for this W there is a unique W prime such that I W prime is equal to W, right? So, which mean that which mean that um, this L V is equal to W V and this is because W is a W prime this is going to be equal to the inner product of I W prime V and this is B W prime B, right? Because because of the definition of, of, of A. So what is conclusion? 
Can you tell me what is the conclusion here? So the conclusion here will be there is, exists a unix w prime such that b w prime v is equal to l v for v. And this is the conclusion of the Rich theorem, uh, the Laxmin Ram theorem, right? So this is a proof which is much shorter and, and simpler than the proof that you see in, in our textbook by Prezis, right? So because the book by Prezis uh, proved the Laxmin Ram theorem using, using uh, Stampakia theorem, this is a, a lot of uh, analysis and this is important for the calculus of valuation, but since we, we are more interested in in application of Laxmin Ram theorem. So, so this is a simpler proof, right? So I, I summarize again. So the idea is uh, what you do is, okay, you fix a U. So when you fix this U, this operator becomes a linear and continuous operator in V, which means that there is a unique a U such that V, UV will be a UV. So this is the risk theorem. Then because of the bilinear uh, property of V, a is also linear, A is also bounded, and A is also continuous, of course. And then we also prove that uh, A is bijective, meaning that for all of the U in H, there is a unique V in H, such that A U is equal to V. Or for all of the W in H, there is a unique W prime in H, such that A W prime is equal to W, right? This operator is linear on H, which means that it belongs to the dual space of L2, meaning that, okay, you have a unique W such that LV is equal to WV for all of, for all of the for all of V's. This is for all of the V, right? Now you use this property to find this W prime. So IW prime will be W. So meaning that LV will be WV and this is equal to IW prime V and this is BW prime V for all of the V. Conclusion, there is, exists a unique W prime such that b w prime v is equal to l v for v, right? So this is the conclusion of the Laxmin Gram theorem. Any questions? It's good. So if there's no questions, we're gonna go to one of the uh, simplest application and example of Laxmin of the uh, of the application of the Laxmin Gram theorem, and then we go. Um, further to the, the finite element method, which is based on, which is based on the Laxmin Gram theorem, okay? So, uh, application. Application. Um, so I'm gonna consider this um, elliptic equation, which is of the form minus u second plus u is equal to f, so you have to find u. f is given, all right? So, um, on zero, one. And u of x is going to be zero, for x is equal to zero, and x is equal to one. Right, so this is uh, an elliptic equation. Um, um, this is an, a simple elliptic equation. One dimensional. Uh, elliptic equation. All right, so solution. So first, we're gonna have to show that there is a unique solution to this equation. Um, there is a unique solution to this equation. And, and solve this equation numerically. Right? Of course, there is no, uh, because there is no exact, there is no exact solution. So, so, so this is an equation that you don't have, um, you don't have, uh, um, you don't, 
so this is an equation that you don't have uh, 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 a solution, uh, an exact solution for this, right? Because I can, I can change the function f and every time I change the function f, you get a different u and then there's no formulation for u. This is why um, first you have to know if there is a solution. If the solution is unique, right? So there is a solution and if the solution is unique and after that, once you know that there is a solution and, and, and this solution is unique, you can design a numerical scheme to solve this equation. So the first step is to show existence and uniqueness. And uniqueness. Right, so uh, so now I'm gonna um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna okay we got we uh, we got consider uh, a test function v right so we're gonna we will convert convert this elliptic equation equation into the form of the lax mean gram theorem all right so 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 my my idea is I, I'm gonna consider a test function v and I'm going to multiply that to this equation, and I'm going to consider weak form. Based on this weak form, I'm going to uh, convert this weak form of this elliptic equation into the form of the Lakshmi gram theorem. All right. So, so, so of course we have to construct a Hilbert space. But before going to the So one of the, uh, the the key step will be to construct this Hilbert space V, all right? But before going to this Hilbert space, what I'm going to do is to construct um, by using via the Lakshmi gram. Right, so now I'm gonna multiply this test function to this equation and I'm gonna integrate. The x and I am going to integrate from zero to one, and this is going to give me integral from zero to one of f the x, right? Right. So, so I have what I have minus u u second u second um, v plus u v. All right, the x. I integrate from zero to one, and this is going to be an integral from zero to one of f v, right? So I multiply v to, I multiply v to both sides of this equation, all right? So you second v plus u v is equal to f v, right? And then I integrate from zero to one. Um, now, how can I develop this guy? Because this this form is not symmetric, right? Not yet symmetric. So I want something which is symmetric, right? So how can I do it? Right? So so the key idea of this is that okay, the left hand side, the left hand side will be B U V. And the right hand side will be L U. LV, right? So V is a test function. I want to show the existence of this U. So, so I need that, okay, the right hand side is a linear operator and the, the left hand side will be, the left hand side will be uh, uh, a bilinear form. So bilinear form require a symmetry. So this U is symmetric because the interval from zero to one of UV you can sweep the um, 
uh, the rows of F, U, and V. But here, this is not yet symmetric. So how do I do? Any ideas? I, so this is something that we did already in one of our previous class. What was it? Okay, so we're gonna do, right. So, so Liu has a very good idea, right? So integration by part. So this is Liu idea. So this is a perfect idea, right? So to get a bi bilinear form and symmetric, um, so what you do is you do integration by part, you have what? You have the integral from zero to one uh, minus u second v dx will be integral from zero to one have u prime v prime dx, right? And then you're gonna have to evaluate, you're gonna have to e evaluate the value of u prime v at zero and one, right? So, so, well, so what is the value of this, this guy? Right, so I do an integration by parts, right? I, I integrate from zero to one of u primes, uh, u second v is uh, equal to integral from zero to one of u prime v prime dx. And this is going to be minus u prime v. And then you have, um, you have the uh, value on the boundaries. What is the value of this? So, so one idea is that, okay, because we choose, because we choose u zero, is equal to v u1 is zero, right? It is necessary that we also have to choose. v0 to be v1, and this is also zero, right? And this is going to be defined in the space, the Hilbert space, h, uh, so this is h, right? So I'm gonna, have to define Hilbert space so that um, u and v can live in this space, right? So, so, so by the um, because u zero and v zero uh, and u one is uh, both is zero, we have to choose that v um, zero is also equal to v one, uh, and this is also zero. And because that's zero, the, so this will be. Um, uh, constructed, um, embedded in um, in H, right? So, so, so the fact that v zero and um, uh, v one are both zero will be embedded in the way we define the Hilbert space H, right? So, so we ch choose that v zero and v one are both zero, which means that this uh, integral will be zero, right? So then you're gonna have the integral from zero to one minus u second v dx. And this is zero to one u prime v prime dx. All right, so this is going to be zero, right? Questions? So after doing integration by part, I'm gonna put this back to this form. And then I have the integral from zero to one of u prime v prime dx plus the integral from zero to one of u v dx. And this is going to be the integral from uh, zero to one of f v. Right, questions? So, so the key idea here is integration by parts and the fact that you're gonna have to choose the, the space H so that if you pick a V in this uh, uh, space H, V0 is equal to uh, V1, and this is going to be zero. So, so, so this VUV will be the integral from zero to one, U prime V prime DX, plus the integral from zero to one UV DX, all right? And then the operator of LV will be the integral from zero to one of FV DX. So this is the bilinear form that I choose, and this is the linear form that I choose. And my task now is to show that there is a unique U such that B U V is equal to L U V, right? Because of that, because of that, uh, 
the tool that I'm going to use is Blacksmith RAM. All right. All right. Right, so now I have BUV. It's going to be an integral from 0 to 1 of U prime V prime dx plus the integral from 0 to 1 of UV dx. And L of V will be the integral from 0 to 1 of FV dx. Uh, and so remember that we need the condition that U uh, zero is equal to u1 is equal to zero and also v0 is equal to v1 and this is also zero Right now what I have to construct is the construction of this uh, Hilbert space Hilbert space H Right so so we want a Hilbert space so we want a Hilbert space H such that um, U and V both belong in this Hilbert space H, right? Because because according to the Lakshmin Ram theorem, the Lakshmin Ram theorem say that okay, U is for uh, so if B is a linear form in H, meaning that both U and V has to be in H, right? So Lakshmin Ram. So B is B linear form from S times H to R. Right? So 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 uh, so we want a Hilbert space H so that both U and V belongs to H because the Lagrangian gram requires that this B linear form is from S times H to R. Right? So so uh, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna define so now I, I, I consider u is equal to v, right? So when is u is equal to v, what do I have? I have bu u will be the integral from 0 to 1 of u prime square dx plus the integral from 0 to 1 u dx. All right? So this has to be defined. This integral. has to be verified. Right, so um, I explain again. So I, if I look into the billion form B U V, if I choose V to be equal to use, right? So then B U U will be integral from zero to one of U prime square dx plus the integral from zero to one U square dx. All right? So this integral has to be well defined. Um, so, uh, so, 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 what is the suggestion for the space H that you can think of? So you are you're gonna need that. Okay, this integral is verified, meaning that you have u prime square dx plus the integral from zero square dx is finite. This is condition number one. The condition number two, u at zero is equal to u at one, and this is also zero. All right? Um, so I have two conditions. First, I have that, I, I need that, okay, the integral from zero to one of u prime square dx plus the integral from zero to one of u square dx is finite. Um, and then I also have that the boundary condition at zero of u and v, they're both zero, right? So what is the space? The space will be all of the function u or w such that, um, W, um, sorry, the space will be all of the function from 0 to 1 to R, right? 
of course, it has to be from zero to one because we are considering the problem from zero to one. So this, the Hilbert space will be all of the function w from w to one, such that the integral from zero to one of w prime squared dx plus the integral from zero to one of w squared dx is finite and w zero is equal to w one and they are both zero. All right. Um, right, so, so, so from this, you can see that, okay, so, um, so from this, so you can see that, okay, if I consider all of the W from zero to one to R, uh, such that uh, the integral from zero to one of W prime dx plus integral from zero to um, W squared dx is finite, then W zero um, uh, is equal to W one and, uh, and, and also W zero is equal to W one and they're both one, right? So, 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 um, who, so now I'm, I'm interested in this guy. What can you say about this guy? Is it familiar? What? So, 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 so if you look only into this quantity, right? So if you look into only the integral from zero to um, one of W prime, square dx plus the integral from zero to one of w square dx is right. Right, Jonathan got it correct, right? So Jonathan, um, um, I, Jonathan has a, a very good observation. Is that, okay, this is nothing but the so we left now of w. So this is going to be the w S1, uh, right, so this is um, S1 norm, or uh, say W12 norm, say um, W12, right, so this is basically a, a, a sobrep norm, uh, because this is uh, the, 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 the first derivative and you take a square, um, and this is uh, the L2 norm, right? So basically, this is the superlap norm, right? So, so, so our space will be the space H of W of zero one to R, such that the W W one two norm on zero one square um, is finite and W zero is equal to, um, this is the, the big W, right? And this is small W. So, so, so let, let me put a tilde so that you, 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 know, you are not confused between the two notation, right? So our space will be, will be all of the function W tilde from zero to one, from the W one to R, such that, um, such that, um, this is uh, the W12 norm of W tilde on zero one is finite. In addition, you also have the condition that W tilde and W, uh, W tilde at zero and W tilde at one, they're both zero. And this space is called W012. The zero mean that, so this zero means that um, this is zero boundary condition. All right. All right. So, so, um, so, so that we, um, um, so W zero two one zero one is a Hubert space. Uh, with the norm. W one two zero one. Right, so so please check. So this is easy, but um, so um, so this is an an an, an easy fact, and, and I am not going to check this. But uh, but um, uh, but I'm going to show you something which is more powerful. 
So W12 has a different norm. Which is the following. Uh, so, so you're gonna have this norm is going to be the integral from zero to one of W two that prime square dx square. Right? So which means that we dropped this guy. Um, I explain again. Um, because because in the B, in the in the form of the B linear, uh, in the B linear form, if you put u is equal to u, then I have um, the integral from zero to one of u prime square dx plus the integral from z, um, uh, zero to one of u square dx. So basically, this is a superlative norm. This is the super, uh, the norm of w zero um, uh, w one two zero, uh, right? So this is a superlative norm. But because you also need the boundary condition, so I'm gonna put another boundary condition, which is w zero is equal to w one, and they're both zero, right? So, so the, so so now this so 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 which means that I'm taking the superlative uh, space w one two, and I put some restriction on that. I, I only consider only the functions whose boundary condition are zero. Right, so which means that I have a new space, which is W120. Um, so this W12 is a Hilbert space with, with a classical norm of, of the superlap, uh, with the superlap norm, but, but it has a, a stronger norm. I mean, it's, this norm is equivalent with the previous norm, but this is nicer because you, so if you look into this norm of, uh, this new norm of W2, uh, W12, zero, then you also only consider the L2 norm of the derivative. What you draw is the L2 norm of W, right? So, so please check that this, this is a Hilbert space, so this is standard thing to check. But now I'm, what I'm showing you is that, okay, you have a new norm, which is the integral from zero to one of W to that prime square dx, right? So, so we have two space, right? Um, norm number one. Uh, we have one space with two norm. So the first norm is W12 square, and this is going to be the integral from zero to one of and this second norm will be W012. And this is going to be the integral from zero to one of W prime square dx, right? And they are equivalent. So on um, W zero one two, meaning that you have W two that is equal to W one and they're both zero. These two norm are equivalent. So proof. Right, so what I'm, I'm trying to tell you here is that, okay, you have two norms. The first norm is for the W12, and the second norm is for the W120. The first norm include the L2 norm of W, tilde, so mm, tilde, tilde, right? And the second norm doesn't include the L2 norm of, um, of, uh, of W tilde. But I'm saying that they're equivalent. Why? Can someone guess why? So the reason is the following. The reason you have the integral from zero to one of W to the prime square. The X is going is bigger than a constant C times W to the square the X. Of course. Um, so let me replace uh, W2 now because it's complete. So, so let me replace this by U, right? So you have one. U prime square dx is going to be bigger than integral from zero to one of U square dx when U zero is U one and both zero. 
So the reason behind this is because if you consider uh, u0 and u1 that both zero, then there is an important fact which is um, the integral from zero to one of u prime squared dx is bigger than um, c times the integral from zero to one of u squared dx. And if you look into the book by uh, uh, Leap and Loss, this is the Sobolev embedding theorem. Sobolev. One of the Sobolev embedding theorem. Right? Right? So I explain again. So this W12 norm doesn't include the L2, uh, includes the, 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 the L2 norm. The W120 norm doesn't include the uh, L2 norm. The reason is because, because when, when you have one, when you have U0 and U1, they're both zero, then the integral from zero to one of uh, U prime squared dx will be greater than or equal to C times the integral from zero to one of u squared x. So, uh, so the proof of this is 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 not difficult, right? So, but it's tricky, tricky proof. So it's require you to know that okay, if you have u, um, Um, so, so it requires a very, very complicated uh, tools in um, calculus one, which is the uh, the mean value, mean, mean value theorem, right? So you're gonna have uh, this is going to be u prime y dy. This is um, right. So, um, so now you you have what you have u x minus u zero. Is going to be the integral from zero to one of u prime y dy. All right. So, so, so this is the only trick that we need. Um, so, what can I say about u x? So, this is the the mean value theorem. You have u x minus u zero is going to be the integral from zero to one of u prime y dy. Uh, this is even not the mean uh, value theorem. This is the definition of, of integral, uh, right? So what can I say about UX? No, UX is zero, right? Uh, U zero is zero, meaning that this is going to be U zero plus integral from zero to one of U prime Y dy. So u0 is zero, meaning that you have ux is going to be the integral from zero to one of u prime y dy. All right? Right, so, so now I can bound ux by what? I can bound ux by the integral from zero to one of the absolute value of u prime y dy. All right. All right. So, which means that if I take the the square of this, I'm gonna have what? I'm gonna have the integral from zero to one of u prime y dy square. But the point here is that here I see the L2, uh, the, the L2 norm of U prime, and here I see an L1 norm of U prime. So what inequality should I use to estimate to get an L, L2 norm of, uh, of U prime? So this is U prime L1. And in some sense, I need uh, U prime L2, right? So how can I do it? So I explain again. Um, I have what? I have u x zero square is smaller than or equal to the integral from zero to one. I have u prime y dy square. All right. So this is the L one norm of u prime. L one norm of u prime, 
And I want something here. I want an L2 norm of Q prime. How, how do I do it? We have only one tool for this, to go from L1 to L2. This is holder inequality, right? So what? So holder inequality say what? You have integral from zero to one of fx gx is going to be smaller than fx l2 gx l2. All right, right. So wrap. So this is to wrap idea. So Surab said that, okay, you, we can use holder, right? So holder inequality said that, okay, so you have the integral from zero to one of fx gx is going to be smaller than the L2 norm of f times the L2 norm of g. So in this case, I'm gonna choose, um, I'm gonna choose fx to be one and gx to be u prime. So say this is y, so that fy to be one and gy to be, uh, to be u prime of y, right? So I'm gonna use whole inequality and have u prime of y dy is going to be smaller than L2 norm of f, which is one dy one half. And then I have this guy, which is the interval from zero to one um, of u prime y square one half. All right. So of course this is one, and this is what we need, right? So this is now to norm of u prime. So now I take a square on both sides. I'm gonna get integral from u prime from zero to one of u y uh, u u prime y dy square is going to smaller than integral from zero to one of u prime y square, and that's it. We we can bow this integral easily right I explain again so we show that okay u x square is going to be smaller than integral from zero to one of u prime y dy square so this is their one norm of u prime so so in the in the inequality in the so black embedding inequality i know that on the on the right hand side left hand side i have u prime so how do i do it I, I apply holder inequality for f and g. So in this case, f is one and g is u prime of y, right? When I do this, I get, okay, this is one and this is the L2 norm of u prime. I take the square on both sides, then I get, I get what I want, all right? So we continue, we continue uh, this on, 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 um, on, uh, on, uh, on Wednesday, okay? So see you on Wednesday. Any questions? Okay, so if there's no questions, we can um, uh, we can stop here. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.